Albert Einstein, Richard Branson, Bill Gates, John F. Kennedy, Tony Robbins, Michael Phelps, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of industries. What else do they have in common? Well, they all have ADHD, but you don't hear much about that, do you? You know what you hear even less about? The successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm an attorney, not a doctor, a lifelong student, not a coach. I'm also the creator of Cortography, a patent pending system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your superpowers, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest superpowers. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Atsuka, and I wanted to welcome you to Episode 19 of ADHD for Smartass Women. This week's topic is all about rejection sen- sensitive dysphoria. But before I go into that, I want to comment about my last podcast. It was podcast number 18, and I believe the title was something along the lines of the 10 things that I wish that every teacher knew about their ADHD students. And I want to tell you how that podcast came about. So I screwed up. And I thought that podcast week, I tend to batch my podcasts and record and research four episodes at a time. And so I thought podcast week was this week, but I was wrong. Podcast week was actually last week. So I really had to scramble in order to put a podcast together. And I realized that I was dealing with some frustration around my son's school. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to talk about that. And so that's how the topic came about. Now, since then, I have responded to the director of my son's school, who's actually a very lovely, competent, passionate educator. And we've sort of been, you know, trading emails and and the thought is that we'll get together and we're going to rehash all this. But what I realized is in my conversations with her, I came away with the sense that what I really struggle with is this whole notion of 504 plans. You have a student whose brain focuses on the connections and relationships between things more than on specific bits of information. You have a student who, in order to proceed towards a goal, they have to know what's the purpose, like why am I going towards this goal? You have a student who has high levels of activity, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, and verbal, sometimes all of them. You have a student who learns by doing, who's guided by this inner drum that he or she has. You have a student who's creative and highly intuitive. You have a student who has strengths just like any other student, and they can learn just as well when these strengths are employed. The thing is, they just learn differently. Yet in order to get a school to accommodate how that student best learns, they have to first label themselves as disabled. And then even then, the 504 directives, to me, they're not specific, they're not measurable, they're not time-bound, they're not creative, and they're not especially helpful. I just feel like we've really pathologized a brain difference. And I think that ultimately that's what I am so frustrated by. So I had to say that because I felt like I didn't say it in the podcast that I recorded. And so I needed to get that off my mind before I go into podcast 19, which, as I said, is all about rejection-sensitive dysphoria. So thank you for allowing me to do that. Now, I didn't know anything about RSD. They, that's the acronym for rejection-sensitive dysphoria. But it had been the most requested podcast topic among the women in my Facebook group. I really didn't want to do the topic because I didn't feel like I had it, number one. I didn't feel like that was something that I struggled with. And, you know, we're all about ADHD for smart-ass women. We're all about the positives. And it seemed like when you're talking about RSD, it was hard to find any positives there, right? So I kind of fought it. But the women in my group just kept asking about it and kept talking about it. I finally decided, you know what? I got to do it. 
So between now and then, I've done a lot of research on it and I learned a lot about it. And I'm really happy that I chose to do this topic. And so I wanted to share with you what I discovered. You know, we know that emotional dysregulation is part of ADHD. We also know that it's not mentioned in the DSM. The DSM, of course, is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. I, <laughs> you know how much I hate that name, but that's what we're dealing with here. Those of us with ADHD, we often complain about emotion, right? We complain about being impulsive, having a temper, low frustration tolerance. We complain about the fact that we often feel like we're overwhelmed by our emotions. We're overwhelmed by the pain or energy of others. Like we can walk into a room and we just feel the pain, right? And as much as that may be some of us, there are others of us who seem to be unaware of others' feelings. You know, we might be labeled as insensitive. We also know that we're excitable. And we know that it's not that we experience more emotion than your typical person. It's that we feel more emotion. And I think most of us can relate to the situation where something happens in our life and we're just overtaken with emotion. And we just struggle with not allowing that emotion to prevent us from moving forward and doing what it is that we need to do. We almost feel like we're paralyzed by the emotion to move forward. We're overwhelmed. It can be as simple as this sense that we're overwhelmed with what we need to get done. So we don't even know where to start. So what do we do? We shut down. Now, we know that emotion is not mentioned in the DSM. Why is that? Why is it intentionally ignored? Well, what I've been told is that it's entirely political and that diagnostic criteria, so what's in the DSM, is for researchers. It's not for patients. The DSM deals with things that can be seen by an observer because that makes research easy to publish. And when we talk about emotion, so much of what ADHD women experience, it's hidden, right? People rarely come out and talk about it. They think that, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with me. If I tell people what I really feel and what I really think, they're just going to think I'm nuts. They're not going to take me seriously. I also think that a lot of women, they're not even aware that this emotional dysregulation is part of their ADHD. It's hard to measure. The thing about it is, regardless of any ADHD expert that I've heard speak on ADHD, they all, without fail, believe that emotion needs to be added to the DSM. And I want to be clear that since emotion isn't even mentioned... You need to know that RSD, it's not recognized in the DSM. And that's how we diagnose ADHD, right? We use that as a guide. Still, I thought it was important to discuss this, regardless of what the DSM says about emotion and ADHD. And the reason I thought it was so important to discuss it is because I saw that there were so many women in our group of smart ADHD women who really could relate to this whole idea of rejection-sensitive dysphoria. So let's back up just a little bit, and I want to talk about the three types of mood challenges that we see in ADHD. Two of them are associated with a number of other conditions, but one is associated exclusively with ADHD. So the first one is overreaction. You know, when we care, we really care, but all the other stuff, eh, not so much. It's probably why I was so shocked. I think I was 30. Someone looked at me and said, you are really intense. And I thought, what the hell? Me? Intense? Oh my God, I'm not intense. I am so easygoing. I'm so just, you know, whatever. Nothing's a big deal. I'm so positive. I'm so make lemonade out of lemons. But she said, uh, no, you are really intense. And when I thought back about it and thought on it, I realized that, you know, the things that I really care about, I am really intense, but I didn't even realize it until someone pointed it out to me. So, the reason we're like this is because of the hyperarousal of ADHD. We struggle to distinguish between dangerous threats and minor problems. And if there is something that is really important to us, we are going to kind of be super intense. We're going to maybe overreact. The second mood challenge is shame and guilt. And there's a study that um, is out of Harvard. It was published 
20 or some odd years ago, I constantly hear, hear it cited that those of us with ADHD, especially those who struggle in school, receive 20,000 more critical messages by the time we're 12 than those who don't have ADHD. So if you grow up with this feeling that you're defective, that everything is wrong with you, that you're stupid, that you can't do anything right, it is very hard to develop a positive self-concept, right? This idea that you know who you are, you're confident, you know what your strengths are, you know what eh, you're not so good at, but you don't focus on that. That is really hard for those of us with ADHD. You know, there's a woman in our group and she has constantly made this comment that she is always wondering what she's done wrong. So every time the phone rings, it's, oh my God, what did I screw up on now? Every time she gets an email, she holds her breath and, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? When she gets a text, uh, I'm supposed to be somewhere. I'm sure I'm not there. You know, that is always her first reaction. It's her first impulse. A lot of women with ADHD, they grow up and they never hear positive feedback. All they ever hear is negative, everything that's wrong with them. And because we're programmed to have this natural negativity bias, and I don't even think this is especially for people with ADHD. I think this is just us in general. You know, it's kind of DNA. But I think it's worse for those of us with ADHD. We are just programmed that bad is stickier than good. I heard a statistics that we need five positive things to combat every one negative thing that we either, you know, are thinking about ourselves or um, that someone says to us. And of course, this leads to low self-esteem. I also have heard a study that all you need is one adult who believes in you if you have ADHD to be successful that that's all it takes, one adult who believes in you. I think that that is why I am such a mouthpiece for my son. I know that at times he's just shaking his head going, oh my God, please <laughs> just let it go. But I want him to know what his strengths are. I do not want him to consistently focus on what he doesn't do well, especially since there are a lot of things in the environment of school that he struggles with. Outside of school, he doesn't struggle at all. That's where his strengths shine. The third mood challenge that you have in ADHD is what we're going to talk about today, rejection-sensitive dysphoria. And it seems to only coexist with ADHD. Whereas 40 or 50 years ago, it was written about a great deal, not so much has been written since then. You know, I don't know how else to say it, but it was kind of utterly forgotten. And Paul Wender, the godfather of ADHD, 40 years ago, he felt that you needed RSD to get the diagnosis of ADHD. But the way ADHD is diagnosed today, we know that they're not even looking at RSD because they're not even considering emotion. So today, RSD, it's not always there, right? Again, it's emotion. It's often hidden. And so it was ignored by the researchers. And as I just mentioned, it's not in the DSM. Now, RSD, let me explain to you what it is. It's the debilitating fear of rejection that sometimes is present with ADHD. Again, it's not always there. And I don't know if it's William Dodson who actually coined the RSD term. I think probably not based on what I discovered about Paul Wender. But William Dodson today seems to be the expert that's always cited when RSD is discussed. And William Dodson is on the board of Attitude. He's also a psychiatrist. He was a member of the Georgetown faculty, and he's worked with ADHD adults for over, I think it's 25 years. Now, according to Dodson, RSD is the one emotional condition that is found only with ADHD. And because it's often hidden, People rarely come right out and talk about it. So, you know, it's been ignored, basically. The other struggle is also the question of, well, how do you measure RSD? Like, how do you know if you even have it? According to Dodson, with rejection-sensitive dysphoria, the person experiences extreme emotional sensitivity and pain triggered by the perception, whether it's real or imagined, of being rejected, teased, criticized a disappointment to important people in their lives, disappointed in themselves when they fail to attain their own very high standards or goals. And at the end, I'm going to give you a self-test that I found on Attitude's website that was put together. I don't know if it was put together by Dodson, but it was put together given Dodson's criteria of RSD. 
So apparently the pain is so extreme that people who experience it, they have real difficulty in describing the quality of the emotional pain. They can't even put it in words. Dysphoria means unbearable in Greek. I want to tell you about my group members and what they say, because we did run a small poll in our group. Of course, all of these women have ADHD. Four times more women thought they had RSD than those who thought they didn't. Our women in our group could clearly relate to RSD. So let me tell you what some of them said. Sunny said that, I feel that no matter what I do, it's never good enough and that I should have figured out a way to do more. It doesn't matter if it's work, home, kids, or whatever. Taylor said, I'm people pleasing to the point that I will hurt my own feelings over and over again so that no one makes me the bad guy. I'm really bad at enforcing boundaries because I hate the thought of someone else being mad, sad, upset because of something I insist on being a boundary. It sucks feeling like a constant doormat. Artie says, my RSD shows up as overly people-pleasing, way overworking at everything in my personal and professional life. She literally said way like that. In my professional life, it's especially bad. Being overly perfectionistic to ensure there is no place for criticism. Only going after jobs that are below me, easy, in order to make sure I don't screw it up or get rejected. Downplaying my abilities, managing expectations by projecting low ones, dumbing myself down intentionally, being casual, less professional in order to defer and ease colleagues' perception of threat in an effort to be less intimidating, and even talking people out of hiring me in my job interviews. Leah said, my whole life I've been more sensitive and never understood it. When I finally got diagnosed with ADHD two years ago and learned about it, this made me realize I wasn't crazy and it was real. Although I've ended friendships with people for perceived slights, which I realize now maybe weren't as bad as I thought at the time, I also believe that everyone I meet absolutely hates me. It can be really hard because in so many parts of my life, I read people so well, but I can't read how they feel about me, or I constantly see it a lot more negatively. It also doesn't help that my mother has spent my whole life telling me what I was feeling was wrong and basically gaslighting me, which has made me not understand my feelings even more at times. Christina said, RSD has probably been the most debilitating part of my life. Even more than the ADHD, it has and does stop me from committing to things, trying things, going outside my comfort zone, all because I'm always in high alert to be criticized, which is mortifying to me. I'm a perfectionist in the truest sense. I can do most things very well when I let myself, but if I think I will fail or feel I'll look foolish, I won't do them. Fran, I mentioned before, and she's going to say what it is that I said she said a lot better. Fran, I mentioned before, and she's going to say what it is that I said she said a lot better than I interpreted it. Fran said, I grew up to win awards as an artist, actor, writer, playwright, and filmmaker, but all the while struggling with rejection and criticism, which is plentiful in the misogynist world of entertainment. The constant rejection and negativity finally crippled me. And I dropped out of the race. Usually I know what a reasonable reaction to my actions should be, but I expect the worst just in case I get attacked. When it happens, I feel it most in my throat. It starts closing up, very uncomfortable. And I feel like I'm going to cry, but usually I can't. I'm stuck in that choked up state right before you cry. My go-to phrase is, what did I do now? The phone rings. What did I do now? Unexpected email. What did I do now? Maybe it should be, what did I do wrong now? Right, Fran? With RSD, there are two results, depending on if you internalize or you externalize the emotional response. If you internalize it, which a lot of us in inattentive ADHD uh, types may do, it's going to feel like an instantaneous major depression. And the thing is that most psychiatrists, they're trained to see mood disorders like depression, but they totally miss the ADHD. 
So this often gets diagnosed as bipolar disorder or depression. If you externalize, it looks like an instantaneous rage, an angry emotional outburst. I think they call it flash anger. And 50% of people who are court ordered to attend anger management treatment for road rage and domestic violence, they have unrecognized ADHD. How else can RSD look in the real world? Well, it can look like you being easily embarrassed. It can look like perfectionism. Your standards are so high that you set for yourself that no one can meet them, including you. It can look like low self-esteem. In some cases, people with RSD may think about hurting themselves. So it's very serious. It can also look like anxiety, especially in social situations, but it's different than social phobia. My sense is that it can cause social phobia because you feel like a failure. You haven't lived up to your expectations or the expectations that you perceive that others have of you. So you withdraw and you stay away from social situations. In that way, RSD can often be misdiagnosed as social phobia. You know, with social phobia, it's an intense anticipatory fear that you're going to say something embarrassing in public or you're going to be scrutinized severely. With RSD, the pain occurs after a real or perceived loss of approval, love, or respect. And the RSD episodes, they don't last very long when you compare them to depression. According to William Dotson, a third of those with ADHD, and that's including kids, list RSD or RSD-like symptoms as the most impairing aspect of their ADHD. You know, as I mentioned, I saw this in our group of ADHD women, right? This group of smart-ass women. They're brilliant. They're accomplished. They can be great in school. They can be model employees. But at any moment, they can spiral down because they misinterpret something as a harsh rebuke, something that often wasn't even meant to be interpreted in that manner. And the thing is that the pain is so severe that people who experience it, again, they say that there are no words to describe it. You know, when they talk about it, they'll use words like, it was just awful. It feels so terrible. It's the worst thing, but there's no real description. So what happens to them is a lot of what our members discussed. They become people pleasers. You know, they're often highly intuitive. So they know exactly what they should say and who they should be to obtain someone's praise and admiration. They become that person that they know the people around them want them to be. When you have such a fear of failure, you abandon your goals. You lose track of your goals. You don't even know what they are anymore. And so it's easy to imagine how resentful you can become when you feel like you've become someone that you feel other people in your life want you to be, you know, that you've become that person. They stop trying anything new unless they're assured of success. So that means a lot of them, they don't go on dates. They just won't even try anymore as far as relationships. They might major in something that they're not interested just because what they're really interested in, they are so fearful of failure in. They may not apply for jobs. They may not speak up in meetings or let anyone know what their ideas even are. I know some ADHD women who probably do have RSD who literally are so brilliant. One of them that I'm thinking about is an engineer, but she will not speak up in social settings. She always lets her spouse give his opinions and then she sits there and nods. They may not have friends because it's just too painful to have friends and to feel like they may get rejected. Bottom line, they don't live to their potential. These are really bright people who do nothing with their lives. And you can imagine that RSD would really affect relationships. If you think people are rejecting you and you start acting like they're rejecting you, you can imagine they're going to start rejecting you. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, you know, I'm always looking for the positives. And so my thought was there's got to be something positive to RSD. What could it possibly be? And this was really interesting to me because I thought there's no way I have RSD. But then I saw this. RSD can lead to a desperate drive to overachieve and excel. Perfect for us smart ass women, don't you think? It can cause that obsession with perfectionism, which we know. I mean, we know there is no such thing as perfect, right? 
And the reality of is in order to get closer to perfect, we have to actually do, we have to put ourselves out there. We have to do what it is that we're really interested in doing. And then when we get the feedback, we can make things more perfect. They can get closer to perfect, but they will never be perfect. You can also start to feel like an imposter, right? Outwardly, you look so successful, but you're constantly striving and achieving because it's never enough. And what if they all find out this is a ruse? You can end up like a hamster on a hamster wheel. Drivenness, and this was huge for me to learn and acknowledge, drivenness is a form of hyperactivity. I'm hyperactive. I'm driven. I never feel like I've accomplished enough. That was one of the examples of RSD, right? This belief that you're failing to attain your own standards or goals. I am hyperactive. I'm driven. I never feel like I've accomplished enough. And that was one of the examples of RSD, right? The one that I just gave, this belief that you're failing to attain your own standards or goals. But I personally love this constant search for new information and wanting more. So I question, is that really a bad thing? I mean, I am certain that busy brains like mine have brought positive, worthy things into this world that perhaps less busy brains have not. So I don't know about that one. Anyway, so what can you do about RSD? If you feel that this is something, these are symptoms that you struggle with, what can you do about it? Well, you can try therapy that teaches you how to develop strategies for recognizing and working with strong emotions. You know, strategies, well, CBT, right? Where you learn cognitive behavioral therapy, where you learn how to focus on your emotions, your thoughts, and your behaviors. Mindfulness might also help. You can work on managing stress in your life since that is directly tied to negative emotion. We know that when we're stressed, we feel negative emotion. And with our ADHD brains, we cannot get motivated if we are in negative emotion. We need to find a way to get positive emotion. And that will then drive our motivation because our motivation is biological. We can also stop perfectionism. You know, I used to have this motto that I'm embarrassed to even mention today, and that motto was good enough isn't. And what that meant is that everything that I produced, all of my work product had to be perfect before I released it into the world. It wasn't long before I discovered that I was basically using perfectionism as a way to manage my fear. It was just an excuse. Recognize that there is no such thing as perfect. And again, you can't get any closer to perfect unless you do first. I also noticed that I could control my emotions by doing. So I always look for the emotion that, you know what, Tracy, I'm really proud of you right now. That is a positive emotion. And if I can find that emotion first, that motivates me to do more, despite all these workarounds and hacks to try to deal with RSD. What William Dodson states is that because RSD is genetic, biological, and neurological, psychotherapies have little benefit. He also believes that while early childhood trauma can make things worse, it does not cause RSD. And I think often just knowing that there's something out there called RSD really helps a lot of women who struggle with serious emotional dysregulation because then they realize that, you know, I'm not a head case. I'm not defective. There isn't something wrong with me. I just really struggle with my emotions. I struggle with these symptoms of RSD. I want you to think about this though, too. If ADHD kids, like when we were little and we were growing up, if we already have a more sensitive nervous system, so we feel emotions more strongly than some child without ADHD, and then we've had all these negative messages thrown at us at a rate that's much higher than a non-ADHD child. Remember the 20,000 negative messages more than a non-ADHD child by the time that ADHD child reaches the age of 12. It's no wonder that we're going to take a real hit to our self-esteem. So what about medication? Is there a medication that can help with RSD? According to Dodson, there is. And he believes that alpha agonist medications like guanfacine or clonidine work best. 
You don't use one or the other. You use both of these medications to treat RSD. And I guess these medications were originally designed as blood pressure medications. That said, this only works for one out of three people. But if you're the one out of this three, out of the three that it works for, this medication can be life-changing. It can be so much better for those women and men that suffer from RSD. It can be so much better than stimulant medication. Dotson also mentions an off-label treatment. So it's not FDA approved for ADHD. And it's called, I hope I don't mispronounce it, tranocypromine. I'm going to include the link to an article where Dodson mentions this in our show notes. So if you want more information on that particular off-label treatment, you can go there into my show notes. So in closing, you know, once I read about the drive to succeed and achieve, I thought, well, maybe I have this RSD. But then I took this self-test, which I'm going to give you the questions to. And I want to say that like all things ADHD, it's all about the degree of impairment, right? And so after I took this test, I realized, no, I don't have it at all. And that's why I really wanted to share it with you. And I'm going to include it in the show notes as well, but I'm going to go through the questions here on this podcast. You know, it is so easy for us to think that we are so much more impaired than someone without ADHD. And there's so much more that someone without ADHD can do that we can't do. You know, and it reminds me of a comment that I heard a productivity coach make, which was, our brains are not meant to remember, our brains are meant to think. Now, before I heard that comment, I was constantly beating myself up about forgetting things. You know, I wouldn't necessarily write them down, but I would think that, okay, I can remember it. And then I wouldn't remember it. And I honestly thought, well, it's my defective brain. That is why I can't remember anything. Then I realized that, no, I probably remember, I don't know, 90% of what everybody else remembers. It's not that my brain is faulty in that way because my brain was not meant to remember. All brains are not meant to remember. Our brains are meant to think. And so that's what made me, I thought about that actually, after I took this test, because once I read all the symptoms, I was so certain that, oh yeah, that last symptom about, I can't even remember what the symptom was. Once I read about that last symptom about, you know, this desire to achieve and excel, I honestly thought, oh shoot, I guess I have this too. (laughs) But once I took the self-test, I realized that No, again, it really is all about the level of impairment. So here goes. And as I mentioned, I'm going to include this symptoms test in the show notes, but here are the questions. Do you ever experience sudden intense bouts of rage when your feelings are hurt? And all of these questions, by the way, the response is either often or not often. So let me ask that that first question again. Do you ever experience sudden intense bouts of rage when your feelings are hurt? Number two, do you ever experience sudden intense bouts of depression when you think you have been rejected or criticized? Number three, are you your own harshest critic? Number four, do you ever feel anxious in social situations because you assume that no one likes you? Number five, Do you consider yourself a people pleaser, often going above and beyond to get on someone's good side? Number six, do you ever pass up opportunities or avoid starting projects because you're afraid you'll fail? Number seven, have you ever been called overly sensitive or a head case because of your strong emotional reactions? Number eight, do you often dedicate more time than is necessary to a project or become perfectionistic to make sure your work has no mistakes and is above reproach? Number nine, do you ever experience your emotions as a physical sensation, as though you've been punched in the chest or physically wounded? Number 10, do you ever feel shame about the lack of control you have over your emotions? Number 11, before you were diagnosed with ADHD, were you told you might be depressed, have bipolar disorder, have a borderline character disorder? Number 12, Do you ever shy away from close friendships or romantic relationships because you worry that if people know the real you, they won't like you? Number 13, do you assume the worst in commonplace interactions, worrying you will be fired every time your boss calls you into her office, for instance? Number 14, do you regularly think that you cannot go on feeling this way? Number 15, Do you ever avoid meeting new people or trying new things because your fear of rejection and criticism is so strong? 
So that's what I have for you for this week. I would love to know what you think about RSD, where you come down on this. Is this something that um, you feel that, you know, you've got the symptoms and it's something you struggle with? Or have you discovered that, nope, I can cross RSD off my list when it comes to my ADHD symptoms? As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. If you've been listening to me for a while, I would really appreciate a review. It's not hard to do. You don't even have to write anything. If you're on the iTunes podcast platform, just scroll down to the bottom and click on the stars. That is it. If you'd like to know more about me, our patent pending cartography system that teaches you how to figure out which of the many interests you have is the one that you should pursue. Or if you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview or a topic idea for this podcast, go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com. You can click on the podcast in the navigation bar. You'll see a microphone to your right where you can leave me an audio message. You can also reach out to me at tracy at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening and I will see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you liked what you heard, we sure would appreciate a review. And not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, well, that's also the name of our free Facebook group. Go look it up. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. We'd love to have you join us. You can also find all my details over at tracyoutsuka.com. Don't forget, I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week. <laughs>